everybody. Thank you for coming out, and thank you in particular for embracing the weather. Uh, as we were discussing, as a newcomer to Dallas, I'm happy to report to you that as soon as I can tell, Dallas shuts down if there's a snowflake somewhere. <laughs> so, you are the brave and intrepid one, so thank you. And my particular thanks to our team, uh, to Rana for sitting around and getting this up and running, and to our new AV people, thank you for that. Really appreciate your coming out on this evening as well. Now, this is, as you know, the last in our uh, series of events for the fall. This is the last for the fall of our Presidential History and Memoir series, which we conduct in partnership with the Bush Library. So we take a moment to thank our friends in the Bush Library for coming here for that tonight. And I think we have a memorable <coughs> conclusion for you as well. But before that, let me just take a moment to thank you all for coming out. Uh, of course, we could not do these events without you and all of your support and all the support that, more importantly, you continuously offer us. Uh, we are deeply grateful, and in fact, we look forward to seeing you next year, in the new year, when we will be continuing this series with discussions of James Polk and the Mexican-American War, and also uh, Andrew Jackson and his war with everyone. <laughs> Especially his own cabinet, curiously enough. And please notice, if you will, another significant event that we're having in the spring, which will be in February, around President's Day, when we'll be teaming up with a whole cast of people and centers around campus and around the city, including the McGuire Center and the Tower Center on SMU's campus, as well as the Sixth Floor Museum and the Bush Library, to do an event for President's Day, which we are entitling, uh, When Life Strikes the White House. Essentially, we are exploring, bringing in 12 scholars from around the country to explore over the course of two days what happens to a president when things that happen to all of us happen to them when they are in office. Things like getting sick, things like having a death in the family. By the way, it's really disturbed to count up how many people who are president have deaths in the family. It's really not good for the family. Uh, and also, when you have something which we're calling uh, personal responsibility, which you might interpret as scandal. So, uh, come up for that in early February, and I'm also pleased to report to you tonight, this just happened, that uh, Harvard University Press has agreed to publish the volume that ensues from that conference, so please come out and get a sneak preview of that as well. Now, let me turn to the main event for the evening, and it gives me great pleasure indeed to uh, introduce a man who I am honored to call not only a colleague, but also a friend. Now, I have to admit to you that it is in fact true that when the idea was first broached of having Ed Countryman give a lecture in this series, I did reply, it will be a cold, cold day before I let him do that. Well, here we are. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's in fact a warm day for all of us here because Ed is one of those people that makes studying history at SMU truly the wonder that it is. He ranks among the top colonial historians in the entire country. He has edited or authored more than seven books and a hundred articles, and he has taught at some of the most prestigious universities in the world, all of course due to his education from Cornell University. Ed truly exemplifies, thank you for getting there, uh, Ed truly exemplifies the dedication to students that is really inspired and met by the university's proclamation for him in giving him the title of university professor. And tonight he is here to tell us about the problem of George Washington and slavery. So it gives me great pleasure, and please join me in introducing Professor Ed Countryman. Thank you, Jeff. I'm, the mic is picking me up. Yes, it is, I think. You may have guessed that my colleague Jeff Engel is a graduate of that place in Ithaca, New York, known on a cold night like this, much colder, as the hangnail of the Finger Lakes. And I won't ask him to join in the real version of the famous Cornell alma mater far above Cayuga's waters, but you know the word, and I know the words, and that, that'll be enough. I'd like to say a little bit about how I came to be doing this, talking tonight about the most founding and most famous of the founding fathers. And as Jeff said, I have worked for quite a long time in early American history, the revolution really more than colonial. And I've never been one for 
what some people would call founding father chic. In other words, it's all down to Washington and Franklin and Jefferson and John Adams and the rest of them. That's not to say I don't admire them. We could have done an awful lot worse than that particular group of people. But my sense of what it was all about is much more a matter of the folks out there, all sorts of folks, getting involved in a tumultuous time. Nonetheless, George Washington has always intrigued me, partly because he's so difficult. He's, he doesn't have Ben Franklin's playful inventiveness. And he doesn't have James Madison's insight, deep insight, into how a Republican society might be made to work rather than collapse under its own inertia. He doesn't have Alexander Hamilton's sense of the capitalist future of this country, and I'll say it in the context of SMU, of the active and important role of government in bringing about such a capitalist future. He doesn't have any of those. Nor does he have John Adams' self-righteousness holding his banner, his reputation in front of him like a banner and pausing every now and then to salute it. And finally, he doesn't torment us like St. Thomas of Monticello. So on that basis, I spent, I got interested in, I guess probably in my first decade here at SMU, late 90s, and did teach a course called Getting to Know George Washington. And this talk in some ways spills out of that. It eventually led to a little publication in Southwest Review. And later, when a major bio of Washington came out and I read it, I thought, OK, I had those ideas first. That's all right. But that, that was my only dip and probably my only dip ever into writing about those people. Now, the other background to it is the book that's on sale outside. Two weeks ago, when the chief White House correspondent of the New York Times stood where I'm standing now, he was, among other things, pitching his new book, Days of Fire, about the, the, the Bush slash Cheney presidency, I'll say it that way, and described it as the first draft of history, which I think it probably is. My book is anything but first draft. It's slim. It's really aimed at the student market, though I've had some trouble getting my own students to understand what it's about. It's based on many, many other people's research. It's a synthesis, although it does, I think, have my voice in it. Nonetheless, that book was possible because of so many scholars who have turned to the question of race and slavery during the revolutionary period. I could rip them off. If I do it, it's called research. If my students do it, it's called plagiarism. And I could rip them off and disguise the words as well, but did put some of my, ideas, some of my own ideas into it as well. So with that, let me find my clicker and get into the talk. What I want to talk about is the intersection of Washington as a person who grew all his life right down to his death at the age of 63, which was six years younger than I am. I better keep running. The intersection of him with an issue that nobody would have expected when he was a young man, namely slavery as a problem rather than as simply effect, a fact. One of the themes in the book that's on sale outside, overpriced, $40, wait for the paperback. But one of the things that's themes in that book is that the revolutionary period, not our revolution, but the period, is the time when human slavery turns from an ugly fact sanctioned by law, history, the Koran, custom, the Bible, you name it, sanctioned by all those things into a problem that is not going to go away. And what I would like to do tonight is explore both that development and Washington's intersection with that development in his own life. So let's think about the man himself. He would like, I think, to have been remembered by the monument in Washington, D.C. that honors his name. He was cold. He put walls around himself, brick walls, stone walls, you name them. Very difficult to know. This is not a guy you could have a beer with to think about some other people who were later to occupy the American presidency. So he probably would approve of the monument. But it does seem to me that Mount Vernon offers a much better metaphor for the man. I suggested a moment ago that he grew. I think he grew all his life, and that will be one of my themes tonight. He grew particularly in terms of the problem of slavery, but in, in other ways as well, as I will explore a little bit. Now, if you've been to Mount Vernon, you will know that it is not what it appears to be. It looks like it's built of stone. It's actually made of rusticated wood, carefully beveled and painted with heavy sandy paint, so it looks like it's built of stone. It's really wooden. Mount Vernon is a very early mink mansion. On that count, Mount Vernon, unlike the monument, is held together by the tension of wood and nails and beams and joists and flooring and side you know, uh, wallboards and all of that sort of thing. I think that's a good metaphor for Washington. Because far from being as marmorial as he would like to have appeared, he's actually a person who was held together by his own internal, internal tensions, which he carefully controlled, but which nonetheless ran throughout his life.
You can see this in a way, even in some of the great images of him. I love the Charles Wilson Peale portrait from 1772 because he doesn't know who he is yet. Look at that charmingly innocent face. Not a care in the world. He is the master of Mount Vernon, including of Mount Vernon's slaves, many of them, and nothing bothers him, not one bit. He's just a big time Virginia farmer, no longer a planter because he was growing wheat by this point, who happens to like uniforms and who does have a fading transatlantic reputation from his, in, his involvement in the Seven Years' War quite a long time ago. But now shift, same artist, Charles Wilson Peale, showing him at the Battle of Princeton in 1775. I think the painting dates from about four or five years later. Look at the difference. The uniform is slightly different. His Virginia militia uniform has morphed into the uniform of the Continental Army, which very few, what's, what's going on there? Which very few people, oops, Getting some, okay, better? Okay, fine. Can you hear me now? Still working? Okay, okay, good. Very few people actually wore that uniform because most of them were in rags, but he was impeccable throughout the war. He wanted to look like a general, but now he knows he's on the world stage. There's no question about that. He's not an ordinary country boy from Virginia anymore. Now look at him in the famous Lansdowne portrait from 1796 by Gilbert Stuart. Now he's almost a Republican king. The sword, the pose, the documents on the table, the window behind with the curtain drawn to reveal his domain behind. Not a king, of course. He probably could have had that if he'd wanted it. And when he chose not to have it, well, I don't think he even chose. It wasn't even a matter of thought for him. George III described him as the greatest man in the world. Kind of a high compliment coming in 1783 when Washington turned in his sword and declined to become an Oliver Cromwell or a Julius Caesar. So part of my point in thinking about Washington is that he could indeed grow. These, this sequence of portraits, formal as they are, showing as they do a member of the Virginia elite who turns into something rather more kind of speak to that point. What about Washington and slavery? Let's start with Martha Dandridge Custis Washington. She was, of course, a young widow with two children when he married her. And he married her for the same reason that any other intelligent Virginia male got married, namely to acquire her land and her slaves, because she already had plenty. She was a widow, not on her own, or not on her own as, as a young woman waiting to marry her first husband. And she brought with him, with her lifetime control of the Custis estate, including vast lands and a very large number of slaves. That was entirely fine with George. It was also entirely fi fine with Thomas Jefferson when he got married. And it was entirely fine with plenty of other people in that time and that place. Don't worry about the young daughter. Go for the widow. That's the way to go forward. They had a good marriage by all states by all accounts, but nonetheless, she plays a part in this story. You can get a sense, I think, of the part she played from this advertisement that was published in the newspaper, signed with, this is, does not have a pointer on it, does it? No, it doesn't. Signed with his own name, George Washington, there it is, for runaway slaves. That's the way it is. He will do what he can to get them back. Who are they to even dare to think of leaving the estate? That's all there is to say about it. You see the same, this is much, much, much later. This is an, a listing of the slaves who actually belonged to him as opposed to her in 1788. And once again, I think we see them as simply taken for granted. You see it again in this latter day portrait. I think it's 19th century, but it shows Washington's family in its colonial situation. You can tell that because he's wearing the Virginia militia uniform rather than the later continental uniform that, with, with, with the white facings and because Martha, was, Martha, Dan, Martha Custis's daughter, Patsy, the topmost figure in the painting, is alive. She died in 1773. My point about this is not the Washington family themselves, but rather the figure of the butler in the background who is bringing in something. That's a commonplace trope in 18th century portraiture, England and America alike. The figure of the black man or the black woman who is there to signify the wealth and the place of the person who is really supposed to be the subject of, uh, 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 of the painting as we see it. So on all these counts, it's simply a fact in his life. And that's my point, that in Washington's early years before the American Revolution, really broke out. This was part of how it was. You bought slaves, if you were Washington or anybody like him, you sold them. You dealt with the states that were being broken up, separating parents from children, because that had to be done to settle the estate in the name of the heirs. And Washington had his hand in that kind of thing. He's just a Virginian of his 
time. You can see a bit more on that count if you take a look at some of the survivals of slavery at Mount Vernon itself. This is, of course, a modern day reconstruction, but it shows one of the quarters as of the early period of, of Washington's control of the estate. It's a simple cabin, reasonably well built. I doubt very much that the actual cabins would have been as well caulked to keep out the cold Chesapeake winds on a night like this. But it again speaks to the normality, the ordinariness of slavery in his life. It's interesting then to compare that version of the slave quarters at Mount Vernon with what now stands if you, will, if you go there as a visitor. This is in fact a modern day reconstruction, but it shows the quarters as two wings coming off of the greenhouse where the exotic plants that anybody like him would want to have as part of their normal life would be grown. This is brick built. It's solid. It speaks to a commitment. But it speaks to something else as well. And again, I'm going on modern day reconstruction, and I think you can see it in this slide inside. I looked at this. I have not yet seen this myself. I found it online. I will be at Mount Vernon next spring, and I'll be interested to find out what it actually looks like. But I looked at this, and I thought, ah, this is after the war, and General Washington is doing his thing. This is a barracks. This is not a place where people are being encouraged to form families or to have their homes. Now, it may have been quarters for single men or single women. I don't know. I'll have to find that out when I visit the place. But I do get the sense, in terms of the brick architecture, that these are permanent structures, rather better than shacks. I get the sense, secondly, from their attachment to the greenhouse, that he would rather that they not be seen, or not seen for what they are, at least. Days for that are over, the same way that Shadwell Row at, at um, Monticello is out of sight from the house. But I get the sense, once again, of control, because Washington could be a controlling man. He would not have been able to be, first of all, the commanding general, and then the president of the United States, were it otherwise. But let's just take a look at another couple of images that might give us a sense of what might have been going on inside the quarters at Mount Vernon. I want to contrast this image of Mulberry Plantation, which still stands, obviously, because it's a photograph in South Carolina, with this painting of the same place done in 1739. Back to the house. The house was built in 1714, and it was a sign that North Carolina, South Carolina, like Virginia, was coming of age. You don't build a house like this unless you intend to stay. If your idea is to get rich and get out, as was the case with many earliest Virginians, and was certainly the case in the West Indies for most of the long, horrific sugar regime, you didn't build this kind of thing. You went to England as soon as you could and left it in the hands of an overseer. So clearly the person who built this house meant to, meant to stay. But what really intrigues me in this image is the way that artist Thomas Coram has reversed his perspective. We're looking at it from the back now. And we're looking at it with a clear view of the people who make Mulberry Plantation possible. And the first thing that caught my eye is those roofs on the quarters. Now, the quarters are arranged in straight lines. I'm sure that was the master's doing. But those roofs look pretty African to me. I can't prove that. But it looks to me that this is not the kind of thatching that an English person would have done. It would have been more rounded. And that pointed quality looks African. Moreover, we know from South Carolina history that even though this is around 1790, these people included an awful large number of Africans fresh from the trade or reasonably fresh from the trade, because South Carolina was still carrying on. Virginia was not. The Virginia population was reproducing itself. South Carolina is a different matter. What I get in this image is enormous tension between what's represented from the front, as you would see it from the Ashley River, and what you see from the back, as you would see it from the perspective of the slaves. And there is, of course, no effort to hide it as Washington hid his quarters in those wings off of the greenhouse, or as Jefferson did with putting Shadwell Row out of sight at Monticello. So let's take one more set of, one more image that will speak to the same point. This used to be visible. You used to be able to go to it. It belonged to Colonial Williamsburg. It's part of Carter's Grove Plantation, which of course is still there. The house is down by the James River. It's a very big, very pretentious, very rich man's kind of plantation house. And these days, that's exactly what it is, because it, Colonial Williamsburg had to sell it off. They couldn't maintain it. But for a while, they had on the way to the house, if you were there as, on a visit, you could not 
get to the house without going past the quarters drawn on the left and shown on the right with interpreters in costume and in role who would not let you go past without seeing what made this possible. That's part of the story. What I find more intriguing is the contrast with the layout of a Mount Vernon or a Mulberry or a Monticello in terms of what you can see in the drawing on the left. These places do not face outside, they face inwards. These are places of community, and it's a slave community. These are people who are doing their very best to hold onto their families and their identities, just as I think you see with the roofs in the image from, from, from um, Mulberry Plantation, a very different way of being alive in 18th century Virginia from what you find at least planted on the land in the layout of any of the great estates, Mount Vernon included. With that, let's shift to another theme. I want to spend a little bit of time with the problem of slavery in the Revolutionary Era, and I'm going to pull away from Jefferson, sorry, from, I'm going to pull away from Washington himself, although the first slide does in fact speak to that problem. I think that, that uh, Charles Stewart, um, not Stuart, Charles Stewart, Charles Wilson Peale painted this, and my interest is not Washington himself, it's the figure in the back who is rather more this time than just an anonymous black figure who is there to demonstrate the wealth and the power of the person whose portrait is being done. This is William Lee. Lee trusted Washington. They were close. They, were, they worked very well together. Apparently, Lee was just as good a horseman as Washington himself. And he rode by Washington's side all the way through the revolutionary period. And that's not the only times he would ride by his side. Go out, out hunting for foxes or something of the sort. Lee would be there running nose to nose with Washington himself. Now, Lee's own story is kind of sad. He was injured later after this portrait was done, lost the ability to ride a horse because of the injury to his leg. He turned into an alcoholic. He did die a free man. But it's interesting that in one document referring to Lee, Washington describes him this way, William Lee as he calls himself. In other words, he's trying to claim the dignity of a free person by claiming two names. I know a little bit better than that. I'm not sure how Washington referred to him later on. I probably should check if I ever try to do anything of this sort in print. But the presence of Lee and Lee's story in the Washington story or in the revolutionary story kind of speak to the theme I want to get at. The theme goes like this. The book that is outside for sale, but I've encouraged you not to buy it, so I'm not going to make any money tonight. The, the book that's outside for sale, if it has anything that the other books don't have, has a couple of themes that I think are important. One of them, which I'm going to work hard tonight, is that this problem spreads across the period. It is not just a case of the good American revolutionaries in their pursuit of liberty try to get rid of slavery. It's not that simple. The British are involved. The French are involved. Spaniards become involved. It's a much, much, much larger thing. The second theme that the book raises is that the era marks the beginning of slavery's worldwide destruction. I didn't say the American Revolution because it's larger than that. But it's during this period that slavery does turn from a fact to a problem and that slavery begins to be destroyed, starting with Vermont in 1777, which declared no slavery henceforth from now on whatsoever, might have freed 25 people. It's still the whitest state in the Union. Nonetheless, it was a start. My third point in the book is that it is much more interesting to look at what black people did for themselves during the, with the opportunities that this period brought to them, rather than to either praise or damn col white colonials for doing something or not doing something. So that's why Jefferson only gets a bit of a snide look in every time I mention him. I think that some of that quality comes across in this painting. You see the same theme in the famous Leutze painting, Washington Crossing the Delaware, dating, I think, from 1853. I'm not going to try to explicate it. But Leutze took great care in what amounted to a photo op to get all the figures in the first boat right, not, not only Washington himself, but among other James, James Monroe, who would eventually be president of the United States, who at this point is a young lieutenant in the army. And there is one black figure in the boat, which kind of speaks to the importance of black people in what's going on. This is a military event, and there is a black sailor, very possibly from the 29th Regiment of Rhode Island, which was largely black and largely mariners as well. I'll say more about that in a couple of minutes. In fact, I'll say it right now. Part of the story of black people in the Revolutionary period is that they found, no, it's the story, 
that they found their freedom, if they could, on both sides. They found it with the British, they found it with the Americans. This is a wild card issue. It cuts across all others of the period. Whether you're for the crown or you're for Congress, whether you're whatever they meant by conservative or whatever they meant by radical or liberal, those terms were not really in use. But it cuts across every other issue. It's quite wild. And in this particular image of ordinary soldiers, I think it's fair to say that we are seeing soldiers from both sides. White soldiers on the right, who uh, one of them is clearly in buckskins. I think we can guess which side he's on, but maybe not, because there were people in buckskins who fought on the British side, too. A soldier wears, wearing a blue uniform, so I guess he's a good guy, or an American at least. As for the two black figures on the left, you can't tell, and that's the point. You can't tell. They're, they're fighting on both sides. Let's explore this in another direction. One of the things that I find really interesting about African American history and the history of slavery during this period is that suddenly, after centuries of near silence, we can begin to see faces and hear voices and get thoughts. There's somebody in the room who knows a lot more about African American literature than I do, and I'm looking straight at her face right now, and she may well say that I'm wrong about this. But you know, I mean you, I mean you Angela, of course. Um, but it does seem to me, after quite a long period trying to study, understand the history of slavery in colonial America, that we know a great deal. Plantation records and legal cases and attempts at insurrection and escape events and rebellions. Yes, we know a huge amount from folklore, from archaeology, from all sorts of things. But I had the hardest time in the world when I was writing chapter one of Enjoy the Same Liberty in getting voices. I just couldn't get them. But now we do begin to get them. And I think I pick out Phyllis Wheatley in part because, well, not in part, because she is definitely one of these voices. And we get to her, we're a long way from soldiering. Let's think just a little bit about her for a couple of minutes. Look, first of all, at this testimonial that was published in a Boston newspaper when her book, of poetry came out. It has names of people who would be on both sides of the split. Thomas Hutchinson, the next to last royal governor of Massachusetts, signs it. So does James Bowden, who would become one of the primary, one of the early governors of independent Massachusetts. So does her master, who, and what they're all doing is attesting to the fact that she wrote it herself. Now, the reference here is best placed a few years later when Thomas Jefferson writes his notes on Virginia. He is very scornful of her work, and he doesn't believe it's hers. The poems that are attributed to her is how he describes her poetry. Translation, somebody else wrote it and published the stuff in her name. That's going to be a running theme in the emergence of African American writing and for that matter, of Afro-British writing. Ola Uda Equiano, whom I will refer to in a few moments, written by himself on the cover of his book. Frederick Douglass's first account of his, escapement, of his escape, written by himself. There is, a mother ba mother, uh, there is a manuscript in the museum at Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia, which contains a series of stories written by women of the church, and on the title page, I've seen it, written by themselves. Wheatley had to overcome this, but here we have a, a sense of the sort of pressure that she had to face and of the fact that, yeah, it was written by herself. Now, with that, I want to diverge from just a second from the slides, and I want to read something, which I do have bookmarked, so it's not going to get lost. And I'll put my it's one stanza from a poem that she wrote to the Right Honorable William, Earl of Dartmouth, and this the year is 1772 or 1773 like that. Lord Dartmouth had just taken over as the British Minister for Colonial Affairs, and he was thought to be a friend to the colonies. He certainly was sympathetic to a lot of the themes that were being raised on the American side. And in her third verse, she writes this. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprang, whence these Whence first these wishes for the common good, by feeling hearts alone best understood, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's, fa Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my mother's breast. Steeled, with that was, steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved, such, such my case." And can I then but pray others may never feel a tyrannic sway? Now, what I get there is tightly suppressed but not containable anger. 
that she knows perfectly well that she's not part of this rhetoric about liberty that's flying around because we're in the colonial period, and she does choose to identify it with, with, with it nonetheless. You're getting the voice of somebody who really knows what tyranny is all about. With that, we can turn to the slide that, that I brought up. It shows two things. In 1775, Wheatley wrote a poem addressed not to Lord Dartmouth, but rather to General Washington. She doesn't mention slavery in the poem, but she does write to him and writes to him directly and sends it to him. Washington held on to it. In fact, for a while, apparently, he didn't want to have it released because he didn't feel like having his own horn blown terribly much, but it, it was released. And he did write to her. He addressed her as Dear Miss Phyllis, using an honorific. Now, the woman is free by this point. She had been freed in 1774. Nonetheless, for somebody like Washington to use an honorific to address somebody like Wheatley suggests both what she is accomplishing by making her, herself audible and visible, and it also suggests that Washington is beginning to move on this topic. I cannot imagine Thomas Jefferson doing anything of the sort, at least not without some flat out hypocrisy in his voice. I'll come to an example of that later. He also, when he writes to her, he invites her to come by headquarters. And apparently she did. And apparently she was entertained by General Washington briefly, treated as an honored guest. Now, my point is not to praise him so much, but to suggest that his capacity for growth, which I think runs through his life, is beginning to intersect with the issues that the revolutionary period is raising about human slavery, including the one that I mentioned a moment ago, namely soldiers. So let's go back to that for just a second. Back to these images. When Washington got to Boston to command the Revolutionary Army in, in Ju July of 1775, there were black soldiers in the ranks. Some of them were free, because in New England, at least, it was relatively possible for a black person to become free from slavery, not elsewhere. And some of them were slaves who were substituting for their masters in the hope of finding freedom for themselves. And Washington didn't like it one bit. He wrote to Congress and said, I want these people out. And an edict from Congress went forth that they would be driven out, and that lasted for a couple of months. Because he began to realize he needed every warm body he could get, and by late in 1775, black men were coming back into the American ranks if they were willing to serve, primarily from New England, from Massachusetts, and from that well-known unit in, in um, they weren't any unit, from, from Rhode Island, where there were a large number of black mariners experienced on fishing vessels and long distance vessels whose talents were going to prove really, really important. So when Washington writes to Wheatley, it's not just that he realizes that she's done him an honor, she has, but it's also that he has begun to awaken to the fact both that these people want their freedom and that he needs them, and he will need them very badly. I'll tell one story on this count. When Washington foolishly got himself trapped in Brooklyn and in, in, at the Battle of New York or the Battle of Brooklyn in, in late in the, or in, the, or in the autumn of 1775, had the British closed the trap, had they brought ships up the East River and cut him off, I think it would have been over. He would have hung. The other leaders would have fled. They probably would have been captured. I don't see how the army could have been reconstituted. They didn't because the weather was against them. And in that brief window, Washington employed the services of a large number of primarily black mariners from Rhode Island who got the army across to Manhattan and thus to safety. They could flee New York City, go further north, and get on with the long, long, long task of finally outlasting the British, which is what they did. My point, my emphasis is on the, the members of that 29th Rhode Island Regiment who were, had proven now to be central to the success of the revolution itself. Let's go forward again a little bit. Let's switch to another theme. I made the point that the subject cuts across all other issues during the period, British and American alike. And I'd like to think for a few minutes about the, the, the fact and the limits of British anti-slavery during this time. Let me begin with Lord Mansfield on the left, with Lord Dun then Lord Dunmore in the center, and then uh, Samuel Johnson, the dictionary maker, lexicographer on the right. Mansfield was a man of conservative temperament, and he was also Lord Ke Chief Justice of England. In 1770, a case was brought before his court by an anti-slavery activist named Granville Sharp, more on him in a moment, involving James Somerset, who had been enslaved in America and who had been brought by his master, who was a British official, to England 
where his slavery would be de facto, not de jure, because there was no law of slavery in England, would be just as real. Somerset escaped and tried to disappear into London's black community, which was about 15,000 people strong. He was recaptured and put on a ship bound for Antigua, where certain death awaited him. The punishment of being sent, sent to sugar slavery was, was, was quite sufficient, thank you. Granville Sharp, an anti-slavery activist, got word of this through the grapevine and the black community, convinced Lord Mansfield to give a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of Somerset, which meant that the case could come before Lord Mansfield's court. Principle's important here. Whoever you were and whoever claimed you, you could go before the king's courts and seek justice. That was Mansfield's position. Mansfield didn't want to see the case through. He didn't want to upset any, up, upset any apple carts. That was not his way. But both sides wanted a resolution in court. And on that basis, Mansfield held, A, the Somerset had the right to come before the court, and B, because slavery was, his words, so odious that it takes positive law to establish it, and because there was no such positive law in England, quote, the black must go free. Now, he didn't actually end slavery in England, but de facto, he's, he's moving in that direction. I bring him out because it brings out the point that a very conservative man who deeply opposed what the American revolutionaries were up to, he made that quite plain, nonetheless strikes a blow on slavery because he's forced to, because he's a good judge. What about Lord Dunmore, the final royal governor of Virginia? Corrupt man. Somebody who really viewed his chance to govern first New York and then Virginia as a chance to get rich by lining his own pockets by, for, by fraudulent lands, land sales. I've got plenty of evidence that speaks to that point. However, when war broke out in April of 1775, up in Massachusetts, word spread fast, of course, and black people in Williamsburg came to Dunmore and said, we can help. Dunmore shooed them away. But then in November of 1775, he issued his famous proclamation. It doesn't ring with life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, any of that sort of thing. It simply says that whoever you are, a servant, a slave, if you come to me and are willing to fight for the king, then you have your freedom. When they arrived, about 800 people managed to get to him. By this point, he's out on Chesapeake Bay in ships. But when they arrived, he gave them badges that said liberty to slaves. Now, was he actually an anti-slavery abolitionist? I don't think so. But what we are seeing is both the system is starting to crack because white society is coming open and people taking advantage of that. And there were plenty of people who did, in fact, fight on the British side and who, to some extent at least, were rewarded. Let's go forward a little bit and speak to that point. You can see what I'm getting at with these three images. The one on the right you will recognize, it's George. The person on the top is Lord Cornwallis, who surrendered to Washington at Yorktown in 1781, thus ending the main campaigns of the Revolutionary War. The person below him is Sir Guy Carleton, later Lord Dorchester, who was the final British commander in chief. And, to get, and Washington had, of course, to deal with both of these people. I will take um, Lord Cornwallis first. Cornwallis's journey that took him to the dismal surrender that he had to undergo began down in Charleston with an army that was marching northwards trying to pacify the South. As that army marched, many black slaves joined the army in the hope of their own freedom. Doing menial labor or maybe taking up arms, I don't really know. There's something there to be written, and not my problem. However, when they got to Yorktown and Cornwallis realized that his fortunes were sunk, he began sending these people over the lines. Supplies were dwindling. You're going to eat up some of our supplies. You must go. Sending them out to the tender mercies of the revolutionaries, which were not going to be tender or merciful. I think that's a reasonably safe bet. It's one of the worst moments in terms of Britain's part in the problem of slavery during this period. Guy Carleton was another matter. Carleton was in New York City as the final commander in chief negotiating the withdrawal from New York and from Savannah and from Charleston, all of which the British controlled. One of the terms of the Treaty of Peace, which struck fear in the refugee black community, and plenty of it, was that the slaves, former slaves, would be returned to their masters. Washington, by this point, I think, has real doubts about slavery. But he's the commander in chief on the American side. And he pushes hard on this. The, the correspondence and the records of conversations survive. And Carleton, in effect, said, nothing doing. These people have come to the king's refuge. 
in good faith and we will honor what we promised them. They had been promised first by Dunmore and then by my predecessor, Sir Henry Clinton, not mine, uh, Dorchester's or uh, Carlton's predecessor, their freedom and we will do it. What's in the middle <coughs> is one page from a remarkable document that's called the Book of Negroes. Some of you may know a quite wonderful modern Canadian novel by Lawrence Hill, who was interviewed on Think by KERA only last week on this theme. Angela, do you know it? Do you know that book? Lawrence Hill's The Book of Negroes? OK, fine. It's a novel which is told through the eyes of a young woman who was taken from Africa, goes through everything that slavery has to offer, and it's, nothing is spared to her, finds her freedom by choosing the British side, and then escapes and goes to, Sierra, to Canada and then to Sierra Leone and finally to an old age in London. It's a real remarkable literary achievement. He's a modern black Canadian writer and he's descended from some of these people. The book is a record of the people who were gonna get their freedom. There are thousands of name in it, names in it. These people did leave. They went to Nova Scotia, not the most hospitable of places if you're used to a southern climate, but never mind, it was freedom. Many of them eventually ended up among the founders of Sierra Leone. Now my point in this is that Guy Carleton, I think, makes up for Lord Cornwallis's behavior at Yorktown by honoring the pledge. And it does speak to the larger point that I'm making that this issue cuts across all others. Think about this a little bit further. I mentioned Phyllis Wheatley in the context of the emergence of, if you will, public blackness. People who were heard, people who were seen, people who were known. Well, one such figure, Ola Equiano, is on the lower right. And I'm grouping him for the moment, not among black leaders of the period, but rather among British figures. Granville Sharp, top left. William Wilberforce, who was very active in Parliament for decades on this right, top right, and Thomas Clarkson, bottom left, the person who was largely responsible for the establishment of Sierra Leone as a refuge for people who had found their freedom by choosing the British side during this period. But let's switch back to this country, and let's take a look at some more figures than just Wheatley. Benjamin Banneker, top left, born free, of course, a scientist, a mathematician, Another subject of Thomas Jefferson's scorn, Jefferson did not believe that anybody like Banneker could have done the complicated mathematics that were involved in, 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 in the stuff that he published. <laughs> Wheatley herself, Equiano, the woman on the top right, Elizabeth Freeman, as she renamed herself when she got the chance, previously Mumbet, central to the, begin, to the destruction of slavery in the state of Massachusetts, where about 3,000 people became free in the year 1783. I will show the judge in a few moments, but nonetheless, her activity is important. Below, Richard Allen, the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Let me ask, show of hands, how many of you have been to Independence Hall? How many of you have been to Mother Bethel just down the street? All right, it's at the corner of 6th and Lombard in Philadelphia, and go down. It's a building that's just as historic and a site that's just as historic as Independence Hall itself. It's only a few blocks away from Chestnut down to Lombard. There is a museum. You'll have to knock your way in or ring your way in, but a docent will take you around. And you will see the beginnings of the foundation of black Christianity with Richard Allen very central to this. I'm not going to give you a tour now. I was privileged to get such a tour. I can't recommend it too strongly if you really want to understand the beginnings of the concept of freedom in this country. His friend Absalom Jones, who opened a black-oriented Episcopal church right around the corner from Mother Bethel. They were of different congregations, of different versions of Christianity, but they worked together. Their friend, James Fortin, a businessman, a successful capitalist, and somebody who devoted his life and his fortune, as well as his sacred honor, to the borrowing from the Declaration, of course, to the cause of anti-slavery. And finally, I bring in Toussaint Louverture, not that he was directly inspired by the American events, but rather that what had begun during the American period on both sides, British and Atlantic, found its first great flowering in Haiti after 1791, leading to the establishment of the transformation of Saint-Domingue, the worst hell on earth in terms of how slavery was practiced, into the, free, the second free republic of the Western Hemisphere, Haiti, establishing its independence in 1805. Now, let me think about the way that these things come together in Wheatley's life. I've got here a gallery of people who one way or another brushed up against Wheatley. I've, in fact, I've got two slides on this. 
My point is not simply Wheatley herself, who's enjoying a long-deserved a long revaluation. She was scorned for some time, but now I think we see considerably better. But look at this gallery of folks. Ben, that, that is Ben Franklin on the top left. We would not recognize him. This is his London dandy phrase, phase. This is 1767, and he's settling in. He's comfortable. He likes London, and he would probably have stayed if certain events hadn't gone wrong in his life. He's dressed fashionably. You could, he's famous. He's Dr. Franklin. You could imagine him becoming Sir Benjamin or even Lord Franklin. Not impossible. He's part of Wheatley's circle. When she goes to London in 1773, he meets her, gives her books, and encourages her. Next, Samson Ockham, a Mohegan Indian from Connecticut, a minister of the gospel, as you can see from his costume, one letter survives from her to him. In it, she addresses him in, in respectful terms. They know each other. They'd met. He was a friend of her master and mistress. And she speaks about, quote, our modern Egyptians. She means the people who are being, who are being app appallingly bad towards both Samson's folks and towards her folks. There is a consciousness here as well as a contact. John Paul Jones who wrote admiringly to her when he was not about trying to get French ships down into the sea. Those letters, that, sorry, English ships down under, under the sea. Benjamin Banneker, again, we've seen him. Anthony Benazet in Philadelphia, one of the people who was responsible for bringing the Quakers to a firm anti-slavery position, who made it his life's mission on the American side to attack slavery. Thomas Hutchinson, the last royal governor of Massachusetts, a man who was vilified by his fellow Massachusetts people, even though he was one of their own, born there, educated at Harvard, all the rest of it. And finally, of course, George Washington with William Lee in the background, who clearly is part of Wheatley's circle, if only because of that one meeting and that, that one poem and that letter that, she, that he wrote to her. Now, let's Take a look at our foreign circle. Who have we got? Granville Sharp, the guy who was responsible for bringing the Somerset case in London. The Countess of Huntington, who was that sort of well-meaning English evangelical Protestant person who was likely to be attracted to anti-slavery and who certainly patronized Wheatley, not in the sense of being patronizing, but rather in the sense of giving her sponsorship. They were supposed to meet during Wheatley's visit to England in 1773. They did not, but nonetheless part of the circle. Lord Dartmouth, to whom she wrote that poem that I quoted from earlier, who was also of an, the evangelical Protestant variety, not probably an Episcopalian, formally speaking, because she had to be, to be part of the, of the political establishment, but nonetheless, a person who connected with her. And finally, at the bottom, Voltaire, who read her poetry and who admired it and who, who said so in public. I went looking for more slides of European and French savant, and there were plenty of them, people who admired what Wheatley was up to. I didn't find any this afternoon, but let's let Voltaire stand for a reading public that she reached that stretches across the Atlantic and stretches deep into Europe as well. Point here, she had an anti-slavery circle. It drew upon white people and black people. It drew upon acquaintances and people who knew her only by reputation, but she is connected. It's that six degrees of separation thing over very large distances which we can trace and we can see, and we can see her as part of something considerably larger, the problem of slavery during this period. Now, let's take a look at Washington's anti-slavery circle. Whom do we see? This time I've got the foreigners on top. Thomas Clarkson, the guy who was responsible for Sierra Leone. Marquis de Condorcet. Thaddeus Kosciuszko, the Polish officer who came and served in the American army. The Marquis de Lafayette, all of them actively urged Washington to do something about slavery after the Revolutionary War was over. All of them urged him to invoke his enormous prestige because they figured it would make a difference. Lafayette kept at it for years. Let's do something about maybe establishing a free black community. You free your slaves. We, we, we can do this. And of course, Washington ignores it. Kosciuszko did bequeath 20,000 British pounds for the sake of freeing slaves and establishing a model community. These guys are pretty serious about it. I've also put Guy Carleton on the slide because although he and Washington were on opposite sides, I think it's nonetheless the case that his determined and principled stand against re-enslaving people who had found their freedom with the British 
feeds into Washington's gathering sense of the importance of this issue. Somehow, something has to be done about it. And I've also placed Granville Sharp lower right, and I've done this deliber deliberately. Thanks to a historian's research, we know that in Washington's papers and in the collections of his books at Mount Vernon, there is a volume of collected anti-slavery material. He, in fact, had two sets of anti-slavery material. Lots of people sent him publications on the question of slavery. The volume contains things that he had bound together. Good leather, gold plate on the spine, and all of that kind of thing. And something that Thomas Clarkson sent to him figures in there. Granville Sharp, who was much more hot-headed, also wrote to Washington in more imploring and emotional terms, the volume survives with its pages uncut. Washington never, ever opened it. And of course, they never will be cut, because the fact that those pages are uncut is evidence of his own attitudes. So what do we see? On the one hand, Washington is open to anti-slavery writing by this time. This is not the unthinking Virginian of 1777 or so. On the other hand, he is not open to what we would associate with radical abolitionism when that comes along 60 or so years later. And it kind of speaks to the problem that I'm trying to get at. What about on the American side? More anti-slavery figures. Wheatley, who of course contacted him. The second figure is William Cushing, whom he appointed to the Supreme Court as an associate justice, who handed down the decision in 1783 in what's called the Quack Walker cases that abolished slavery in Massachusetts like that. No halfway houses, no drawn out, it's over. The third figure, his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, active in the New York Manumission Society, and very much a person who was committed on the anti-slavery side. The fourth figure, his Secretary, Tobias Lear, a New Englander who repeatedly harassed him to do something about slavery. The correspondence does survive. Fifth, Richard Allen. I include him because when, when Richard Allen established Mother Bethel Church, Washington was among the donors helping to make the place possible. The subscription was taken up. Ben Franklin, I need not say more. Benjamin Banneker, I need not say more. And finally, George Wythe, who was the chancellor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, meaning that he administered civil law rather than statute law, who tried in Virginia to do what Lord Mansfield had done in England and what William Cushing had been able to do in Massachusetts, namely legislate against slavery from the bench. Cushing, if anything, had gone further because he had declared slavery's over completely in, in Massachusetts, which went rather further than Mansfield's decision over in England. Well, with tried it. People came to him and said, help us. And he was willing, because he was anti-slavery himself. And for his pains, he got murdered. Um, it, says, it speaks to the difference between Massachusetts during this time and Virginia during this time. Not that I want to denigrate Virginia awfully much. Let me come to a conclusion now, so people can get out and get home. Let's try to ask what this really adds up to in terms of the first president of the United States and the emergence of slavery during this period. Now, I really don't like to get into historiographical arguments in front of a, a, you know, a, a general audience, but I will say that there is a historian out at UCLA whom I know and admire deeply. He's done wonderful stuff all his life, and he's among my competitors in the market that enjoy the same liberty he tries to, to, to reach. And he says something in that book, which I think is just plain dead wrong. He raises the possibility that had Washington, Ben Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson pooled their enormous prestige and taken a principled, all of us together stance against slavery, which for Washington and Jefferson would have meant freeing the slave populations, that slavery might have ended then and there. I just don't think that was so. I don't see it as possible, not given the strength of slavery south and north alike. This thing was going to die very, very hard. It was going to die hard throughout the hemisphere. It was going to die fast and hard in Haiti, and it was going to die slow and long drawn out hard, most of all, in this country. So the notion that my subject tonight, George Washington, even with Jefferson Hetty, been willing to do anything, which he usually wasn't, and Franklin, who was willing to do something, but who was not a slaveholder big time, I don't think they could have done it. What can we see, though? Well, let's go back to this image, which I used earlier on in the talk. This is the Gilbert Stuart Lansdowne portrait from 1796. By this time, Washington is a tired man. He's I'm something of a sick man as well. I mean, the Washingtons were not long-lived. 
And he probably realized that his own time was getting pretty close. And among other things, he wanted out of the presidency while he could still enjoy life a little bit. Footnote to this, I can think of only one comparable figure who walked away from power like that, and that's Nelson Mandela. That's not such bad company. We see here the quasi-regal President King. We also see a person who by this point has had some serious shocks on the question of slavery, although he's keeping them quiet. We see somebody who has seen his slaves escape. I'll say more about that in a moment. We see somebody who has been bombarded from many directions by people saying, do something about slavery. There's no question, I think, on that count either. And we see somebody who's presiding over a republic which has now become half slave and half free. Colonial America, slavery was everywhere, all the way from, well, really from Quebec to Buenos Aires. His America, it's dying or dead or beginning to break up in the North, and that's a great big difference. There is a story, I've never been able to track this quote down, but in one of his biographies, one of the biographies of him, the author tells the story of Washington saying to another Virginian in 1797, that he foresaw the breakup of the Union on the question of slavery. And I'm going to quote what's attributed to him. If that happens, I shall have to move and be of the North. I've turned George Washington into a Yankee. I'm not ashamed to do that. But he, he I mean, I don't know whether that quote is true. Because I, I've tried to track the quote. It's an unfootnoted book, and I just haven't been able to find it. But I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that there is more to the difference between the quasi-regal president of the republic in 1796 when this painting was done and the Virginia planter of 1772 than just the fact that this man is a world figure and the earlier one was just a local guy who happened to like uniforms. That begins to speak to my point. Slaves did escape Washington. <laughs> Harry Washington, who was part of Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian regiment and who ended up in Africa. 17 slaves who joined the British when a British ship anchored off Mount Vernon and demanded food. Food was given, Mount Vernon was not burned, but a fair number of the, of the Mount Vernon slave force grabbed their moment to head for freedom under the Union Jack. His chef, Hercules, during his time as president in Philadelphia, who managed to make his escape, and most interestingly, the figure of Oni Judge, who has now become something of a figure of, of children's books, as you will find if you, if you Google her. She was Martha's slave, not his. He did not have it in his power to free her. All he had, had over her was the fact that he ran the Custis estate for the benefit of Martha and of Martha's children. He and Martha, of course, had no children of their own. She escaped sometime during his second term in the presidency. She made her way to New Hampshire, where her presence was well known. He advertised for her. Here's the advertisement. I find it interesting that you can read it absconded from the household of the President of the United States, Oney Judge. And that's the last mention of him. I contrast this with the 1762 advertisement that I showed earlier, because unashamedly he signs it George Washington. I take that as evidence that though he has to identify who the master is, he's got his problems about this. We know that they carried on negotiations. Please come back. Martha values you, which apparently she did. Nothing doing, says Oney Judge. I'm not doing it. Now, what I like here is the spectacle of this escaped slave up in New Hampshire, smart enough not to get on a ship which says it's going to go to Philadelphia. In no way, it's going to go to Virginia. We all know that because he had been rotating slaves back to Virginia regularly so they would not be able to claim freedom under Pennsylvania's anti-slavery law. Smart enough not to do that and gutsy enough to argue with President George Washington and get away with it. Very few people were able to do that with this particular man. He was not a guy who took no for an answer. Unlike Andrew Jackson, who will be talked about in the spring, he wouldn't shoot you. But this was a person of enormous authority. And she manages to do it. It speaks to the point that he's feeling the anti-slavery pressures right in his own household, and she is not, in the end, recaptured. He may have advertised for her, but he would not send out a force to get her back, even though the United States Constitution said that was OK. Now we come close to the denouement. On the left, his will, in which he freed his slaves, at least the ones who belonged to him. Well, I, I guess that's redundant. He could not touch Martha's slaves. The terms would not allow it. However, in his will, he provided for the freedom immediately and without compensation of all of the slaves who belonged to him in his own name. Well, not quite immediately. They would become free upon the death of his widow. 
He wrote in the will, it is my express desire that these people become free. In other words, he knew that the will might be challenged, which would always be fun. He made it quite clear what he wanted on this count. Martha was no fool. She knew who was cooking her food. She manumitted his slaves, but not hers, fairly soon after his death, because she kind of liked the idea of living a little bit longer, and, well, she knew who was cooking. That kind of speaks to the dilemma that Mount Vernon poses. I showed it at the beginning, I show it at the end. Like the monument in Washington, D.C., it's slave built. Unlike the monument, it's not stone, it's wood, it's fragile, it could have been burned, and it's held together by tensions. Washington himself felt those tensions and did what he did, which could have been more, but it could have been an awful lot less as well. He is the only one among the founding fathers who possessed a large slave force who freed that slave force and thus put himself publicly on record on the question of what does it mean to be a Virginian and is slavery rightful in the situation that he had helped to bring about. Yet, of course, Mount Vernon remained the site of enslavement until the much larger struggle that was required to destroy it in this country had finally run its course in 1865. What we see then speaks to the point that I was making at the beginning of the talk and that I try to make in the book as well, that we see here the beginning of slavery's death agony in this period, but it's only a beginning, and that agony is going to be long and hard. Thank you. microphone, which is actually working. That's awesome. Uh, and if you would speak into the microphone, that'll help us record your thoughts for posterity. So, who's got the first critique? Sir. You came to the lexiconographer, uh, lexiconographer uh, Samuel Johnson, mm -hmm. but you didn't say anything about it. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that, Bo. Um, I do know this gentleman. Um, his, the reason I included him is his famous comment in 1776, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? He was deeply opposed to the American cause and saw the hypocrisy on this count. He meant that quote, that, that line to sting, and sting it did, because they are talking about a generalized human liberty to which they are not living up. That's, that's, and I, I should have, since I was working without notes or a script, I'm sorry for that fault. Ruben, you look like you want to. My, teach, my teaching assistant, who, the gentleman in the back. What happened to They stayed enslaved. After her death, they, well, the family, those slaves remained enslaved right until the end. There is a book about this that I was looking at. But yeah, but that, that, that is the story, that the Custis heirs wanted them to remain enslaved because they were a major part of the fortune. I, the reason I think that he wrote, it is my express desire that my people be freed, was to overcome any tendency towards defeating the will. And the, the, the will was not defeated. Jeff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not satisfied. Um, Why aren't you satisfied? I'm not satisfied with Washington, because it, I'm se not either, it seems to me that freeing his slaves upon his death, freeing her slaves mm -hmm. upon her death, et cetera, is what the economists would say is cheap talk. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't bother him in the least. He's mm -hmm. dead. He's dead. How does that not make him insufficient, a hypocrite? How does that not make Answer. him? I mean, okay. Uh, first of all, first so of all, life, you, life is hard without slaves. I get it. Okay. But, you know, he also fought the British. He did right. hard things in his life. If you, I, I agree with this point, that you could certainly throw a charge of hypocrisy. I mean, if you want some serious hypocrisy, go out west towards Charlottesville and climb a mountain and there's a house with a dome on top that looks a little bit like Dallas Hall. There's some serious hypocrisy on this topic because the only people that Thomas Jefferson ever freed were his concubine Sally Hemings, who was freed at his death, and her, the, her, the, her children with him. In the terms of Washington, I'm not, I was not here to either praise or bury Jeff. I wanted to use Washington's figure to illustrate the larger point that something does get going during this period, but it's going to be one heck of a fight 
to actually bring about the end. And that, that, that was the theme I was really getting at. And you may have picked up with, from the intertwining of what black people did for themselves in Washington's story that really it, what interests me a lot more is that latter topic. But it does intersect with him. And you can see in him both the possibilities and the limits. Possibilities, yes, slavery has turned into a problem. Possibility, yes, manumission is now possible. That, and, and he takes advantage of Virginia's manumission law. Before 1785, credit to Jefferson, he was responsible for that law. Uh, it, I give him credit, okay, fine. Um, I know, I have real problems with that guy, but never mind, we won't go there, that's for me and my psychiatrist. No. <laughs> Credit to Washington, credit to Jefferson and the Virginia legislators, they changed the law so that it became possible for a well-meaning master to free his slaves. Credit to Washington for acting under that law. This is not militant abolitionism. This is a recognition of a problem, which a lot of other people are recognizing in a lot of other ways. And to illustrate, let me go north for a bit. I mentioned Vermont, where slaves become free under the state constitution of 1777, like that. Well, I'm descended on my mother's side of Vermonters, so I kind of like it. But 25 people, maybe, that's it. Massachusetts, slavery ends instantly in 1783 in the Quack Walker case. Okay, 3,000 people. New Jersey begins gradual abolition in 1801, and there are still a handful of slaves in New Jersey in 1861. New York begins it in 1799, and slavery doesn't end until July the 27th. 1827. Sojourner Truth, the black abolitionist, was a slave in New York, not in South Carolina or someplace of the sort. Pennsylvania begins it in 1799. There's still a handful of slaves in Pennsylvania in 1845. That's the same glacial pace that you see with Washington and that you see, in fact, further away in the hemisphere because that's how long it takes in the Spanish-American republics as well. It's not as quick. So my point was not to either praise or bury Washington, but rather to say that in this dimension of his life, he illustrates the larger issue that slavery has become a problem, which ain't going to go away. I, I think you make that point, but let me, let me push you and say you, you, you came not to praise or bury him, but I'd like to hand you a shovel. Okay. Uh, because you mentioned that Washington takes advantage of the Virginia law in, of 1785 mm -hmm. that allows for manumission. Mm -hmm. But in truth, he does not mm -hmm. because he is dead when he frees his slaves. He actually does nothing, yeah. mm -hmm. in a sense, to free mm -hmm. his slaves during his I, lifetime. I, I wouldn't dispute the point. So, I, I, I mean, I, and I can appreciate, yeah. I mean, it, it, the guy's dead. He's, a, yeah. you know, throw, it, it, and by the way, I have a good moral position here. I'm against slavery. Oh, uh, yeah. you're kidding me. But it's, it's, it's striking that it's one thing, you, you mentioned time and again, his advisors, mm -hmm. his subordinates, his lieutenants are writing him saying, mm -hmm. make a public stance mm -hmm. against slavery. And he doesn't. He doesn't, but could he have, in the context of the time, made a public stance against slavery by freeing his own slaves with, without, without actually going out and saying slavery is wrong for the rest of you? Is there, was there room within the political spectrum for him to do that? Or by freeing the slaves during his lifetime, would he simply have been making too dramatic a statement for the times for him to have maintained well, his social status? Well, you could argue the latter because he did see himself as presiding over the country. And there's these South Carolinians and these Georgians who've already made it entirely plain in the Constitutional Convention that they'll quit if slavery comes under attack. You could take that point. You could see that as, as this major project. One other point, though, that I'll bring in, that he's president when Haiti explodes. And he and his successor, John Adams, are not terribly hostile to the Haitian Revolution. They send United States naval ships, which give some support to the revolutionaries. They don't recognize Haiti as an independent republic, but it doesn't claim to be one until 1805. When the third, Virgi second Virginian to occupy the office, oh, you know I don't like this guy, when he takes off over in 1801, Haiti becomes like Cuba is now, something we don't talk about. It's, it's just plain not there. And not until 1861, when somebody else takes office, does Haiti gain di diplomatic recognition. So again, my point, we're not looking at a resolution. I don't think a Haitian solution was possible. We're only looking at a recognition that during this period, there was more to it than either Crispus Attucks, whose death came very early indeed, or Yelps for Liberty among the drivers of Negroes. Ruben. Okay, so we know that um, Jefferson in his notes of Virginia had some very 
um, unkind words to say about African Americans mm -hmm. and slaves sure at the did. time. And we know that he um, um, he struggled with with, uh, with slavery itself, mm -hmm. going back to the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. can, is there a way that you can sort of give us a contrast between Jefferson's attitude towards uh, slaves and African Americans and Washington's position? Uh, along yes, I those think lines? I can do that. And thanks, you. But I was expecting this gentleman has been my teaching associate all year, and he doesn't take anything I say for granted. We have had many arguments in my office over what I'm so great, Ruben. And I say that admiringly, and not 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 to put you down. And you've actually given me a softball. Um, <laughs> I should say, by the way, that as a little leaguer, I could not throw, hit, or catch. So why did I ever bother to use that image? Anyway. Um, when Jefferson touched on slavery in his writings, something always happened. Some people in the room may know, there are people in the room who do know, because I've taught it to them, the, that in his draft of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson tried to include slavery as a grievance against the king on two counts. One of them <laughs> was to blame the king for forcing slavery upon colonists who didn't want it. That's historical nonsense. They had created it themselves and created slave law themselves. And the other was to blame the king through Lord Dunmore for encouraging slaves to rise. That's not nonsense, but there is a certain illogic. If you've got rebels in the name of human liberty who are holding slaves, that the slaves should not say, mm, yeah, us too, and on, on your side. Well, you see that in Jefferson. It was bad writing, we know that, and it was cut out by Congress because it was illogical and ahistorical. And I've had students who've put up with that line for me for long enough. Okay. In the notes, Jefferson turns to slavery in, in query 14, which deals with the laws. And he's writing along in his usual calm, cool, and collected way. And he's not typing. They didn't have typewriters. They didn't have computers. Way. He's writing. And he mentions the law to bring about the gradual abolition of slavery in Virginia. And then watch him go. He launches into page upon page upon page of writing on this thing. First thing he does is show quite clearly the bitterness between master and slave. He understands that, because he's a master himself. And he shows what being a master does to you, that if you, as a child, can tell an adult human being what to do on the pain of that adult's physical well-being or life, then that, yeah, that's corrupting. But then he raises the issue, well, what if we end slavery? What happens to black people then? And his argument is they must go. And he trots out every racist canard that had ever been raised at that point. We could go on at great length about it. Now, my point, Reuben, in response to your question is that what we see here is the Jefferson who is capable of great flights of rhetoric and emotion that Washington just could not do. Washington could not write like that. We see something else, too, because Jefferson did, does get credit for, for preventing the further spread of slavery into the Northwest Territory, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, places of that sort. But he doesn't do anything about slavery south of the Ohio River. Instead, he comes up with the absolutely harebrained notion that slavery would become diluted if it was, be, if it was allowed to spread. And the good small farmers would want to get, slavery, get rid of slavery. So somehow we're going to get rid of it. Pure wishful thinking, which is characteristically, characteristic of Jefferson at its worst. The reality was going to be the Mississippi Yazoo Delta in 1850, where 300,000 people are, are, are laboring. So what I'm getting at, Ruben, is that Jefferson is capable of these great flights. But if we're looking for inaction, he is much more the man of inaction than, than, than Thomas Jefferson, than, sorry, than George Washington was. In, there's a lovely little mistake in my book. Thomas Jefferson's great contribution to the history of anti-slavery, because I do have to discuss him, came in just four words. All men are created equal. That's five words. Oh, well. <laughs> But that, that would be the difference, I think, that Jefferson can fly rhetorically, Washington cannot. But did Washington He never used that kind of rhetoric. He never invoked any of the canards that Jefferson brings out in the notes on Virginia. And he never says that black people have to go either. Now, what does he say? Well, he is a tightly controlled man. But my, my major point of reference here would be Phyllis Wheatley, because he addresses her respectfully and with the honorific that he uses. And I just cannot imagine Jefferson doing that to any. Well, for example of this, that Benjamin Banneker wrote to Jefferson when Jefferson was Secretary of the State, after Jefferson had published the notes on Virginia. 
And he addresses him respectfully, Mr. Secretary, how is it somebody like me is writing to you? And then he lit lights into him and takes his rhetoric and turns it against him. And it's a long, extended art letter. And it's very eloquent, very powerful. And Jefferson grits his teeth and writes back, thank you for your letter. And then he writes to a friend of his, the poet Joel Barlow, and describes Banneker's letter as just no, not worth thinking about. There's nothing here that's worth thinking about at all, because he will not see. And you read the letter, and you can see that this is pretty good prose, really good stuff, and heartfelt. Jefferson dismisses Wheatley, dismisses Banneker. Well, I don't see Washington dismissing people, but he is the haughty guy on the horse, who he is all his life. Do, do we have any evidence of Washington enjoying sexual relations with None, slaves? as far as I know. There, there are stories around. I mean, there's nothing like the good evidence that's always been around about Jefferson and Hemings, which people have just ignored because it came from the Hemings family, but which is now incontrovertible. No, well, now, we, this is arguing from a negative. It seems that he was physically sterile. So if he did have relationship with a or several black women, we wouldn't know. He wasn't able to have children with Martha, and she was certainly fertile. And by the way, on that count, <laughs> why not? That when he got married, he wrote off to London and asked for aphrodisiacs. That's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to make this guy human, you know? My question is uh, uh, Washington's influence on the future uh, later political debates. And uh, so uh, how, does, uh, how much does uh, Washington influence um, later political debates about slavery? How much do people know about how Washington um, treated slave, slaves and then deal, dealt with slavery? And um, you know what? is there any influence? You know what? You know what? There's no book on that at all. Ruben, you want to change your dissertation topic? No, there isn't. I really don't know of any. I mean, I went searching as I was getting this talk together, first of all for Wash U and then for UNT and now for here. I, I bought everything I could find on, on uh, Amazon, and that means some, some pretty rare stuff. And I know of nothing that addresses that topic. That's great. Any final question? Thoughts? I'm cognizant of the ice approaching. So uh, if you would, this has been a wonderful, wonderful way to conclude our semester, and we look forward to seeing you next year. But first and foremost, please help me in thanking Professor Countryman.